Welcome to the first lecture uh, for International Money in Finance. What is this course about? What is International Money in Finance about in the way I teach this here? Well, one way to organize our thinking here is to distinguish between quantities and prices. Uh, and we try to organize the lecture along this distinction. Yeah, so in terms of quantities, what we are interested in in international money and finance are the resources which are transferred from one country to another in a given time period, typically a quarter or a year. Yeah? Uh, this is borrowing and lending, if you want. So one country does relatively well, so it's ready to lend to another country. A country is doing poorly, so it's borrowing or it's doing well and it's expecting to do even better in the future. So it's borrowing today to finance some investment project. That's the basic idea here, why a transfer of resources from one country to another may uh, make sense at certain times. Okay, that's the quantity aspect of international finance. Now, prices are also important and here we think first and foremost exchange rates because when we think about resources in an abstract sense you know you could think okay i lend you apples or bananas or whatever fruits or real stuff but as an actual matter lending and borrowing across countries takes place in different currencies uh, and the value of these currency changes over time euros dollars british pounds and it's intriguing to think through the determinants of these uh, exchange rates, the prices of currencies expressed in each other terms. Uh, and that's what will keep us busy also for a great deal in, in this lecture. Okay, roughly speaking, the overall question in that course here is what determines exchange rates, say prices on the one hand, and cross-border financial flows, say resource flows, on the other hand. Yeah. Now, the first thing to recognize is that these cross-border flows have become increasingly complex over time. Yeah. I mean, uh, if you think about it, you know, perhaps you are investing in stocks through some exchange-traded funds, ETF, that's a very popular investment strategy these days. You buy a, a global portfolio yeah, and maybe the ETF, you know, is just a synthetic derivative based product, which does not actually buy shares all over the world, but some derivatives. Yeah? So this can be very involve some very complex financial flows. Yeah? Against this background, we try to focus on the key aspects. Yeah? And uh, in some sense, you may be even shocked by the simplicity of our analysis, but we, we think we have found an appropriate level of complexity, which allows us um, to capture the essence still of this cross-border trade of, uh, of assets, of the cross-border flows of resources. Yeah? But it always depends on the context, and sometimes you know our models may be too simple, and then we have to work harder to account for additional layers of complexity. But the basic idea here is, we recognize from the start this huge complexity which is out there and we recognize that in order to make some headway in understanding the key aspects, we need to simplify, simplify, simplify. Okay. So my aim here is to develop an analytical framework and the nice thing is that I will try to work with the same analytical framework throughout the lecture basically with some modifications here and there. But the basic core framework is the same, and it's very simple. And this framework, as we develop it, will guide our analysis of the data, which will be very limited. This is not an empirical class, but we will look at the data and we will try to do some basic econometrics here and there. But the focus is on this conceptual theoretical framework, which we develop, and this will guide our perspective on the data, but also on on recent developments okay so we look at the data and um, now a new approach in looking at the data in my my courses developed during corona times and in preparing these classes is um, to do this 
on the spot and to ask you to do this on the spot too. Yeah? And so I start here, second slide of the course, with some list, with a list of some data sources, which I found useful. And I should also say um, this, there has been some huge progress in data provision by various institutions. You have some nice interfaces and, uh, you know, since there are many different competing providers, sometimes for the same data, it can be cumbersome at times to understand how these interfaces work. I mean, they are, they are very simple, but still, if you switch, you know, you may get annoyed. So, um, to be honest, I haven't settled on one single uh, data provider yet. And so, you know, you may witness uh, me in, um, experiencing some difficulties, you know, in how to um, uh, work uh, in uh, getting this data um, downloaded, for instance. But uh, I think it's also nice to see these different interfaces and it accommodates different tastes. So, so here's just a totally um, non-complete list of data sources which I'm going to use in this course. So I will uh, look at central banks for data, the European Central Bank has a statistical data warehouse which has been revamped lately and it looks much nicer now than just a couple of months ago but some of the data you still get through the old website which is not so nice so that creates some complication then the american u.s american central bank the federal reserve system has a very nice database in its st louis branch that's the FRET database um, Federal Reserve Economic Data Database, that's what the acronym stands for. Then I also download data from the Bundesbank or the Bank of England. I rely on international organizations such as Eurostat, the statistical agency of the European um, Commission. Then you have the OECD, the IMF, and uh, also interesting for international finance is the BIS, the Bank of International Settlements. Yeah. Let me add this here in case you haven't come across that one yet, Bank of International. So that's an institution located in Basel, Basel, and they are concerned with the interaction of central banks with each other. So it's kind of sometimes labeled a central bank of, uh, of central banks. Yeah. So, so, and they are very much concerned with international financial flows. Uh, they have also very rich data on exchange rate, but also on uh, financial flows. Okay, so, but since I told you one of the two things, we have quantities and prices, and in terms of prices, one of the key aspects is, is prices. And so um, here, I, whenever you see this, um, this font here, it's a link, it's a direct link, so we can uh, use it to get to um, the database directly. So here we are at the ECB. You can also try to Google this, but again, since this interface has been restructured recently, I found it very um, hard to end up at this particular page. So I included a direct link here. So, but then it looks nice because it gives you here for major currencies, uh, the exchange rate with a the Euro. So here, for instance, is the US dollar with a the Euro. And here, by default, it's quoted in the following way. So it's the price of one euro expressed in dollars. Okay, now that's an important first hurdle. Because later when we write down models, we will use the convention that we express the exchange rate as the price of foreign currency expressed in domestic currency. Yeah. By the way, that's the opposite of what we did in macro one, which you may have attended in the first semester at Tübingen. Yeah? Uh, there we have defined the exchange the other way around. It doesn't matter, you can de define it either way, you just have to know how you define it in the context of a specific analysis or in a context of a specific model. Okay, so in international money and finance, we define the nominal exchange rate as the price of foreign currency expressed in terms of domestic currency, okay? Because that convention is more common in research literature, which we will discuss here more frequently than say in macro one, okay? So since we are in Europe and our domestic currency is the Euro, we have to change the convention 
and we, we switch to this guy here. So, oops, we say we are looking at the exchange rate and our domestic currency is the euro. So we're asking how, what's the price of one unit of foreign currency, say $1 expressed in euros. So as of March 5 in 2021, that's today, yeah, uh, you would pay 86 Euro, uh, 83 euro cents for $1, okay? You can also look at how this changed over time. How did it change over time? You see here, you can get all the time series. Yeah. So, and then you have some 20 years of data, the euro stored in 99. Yeah. And so you see how the change of the, um, uh, how, the, how the price of the dollar expressed in euros changed over time. Whenever you see this line going up, that means you pay more euros, which means the dollar appreciates or conversely, the euro depreciates when this line is going up. So taking the perspective of the domestic currency, say the euro, going up means the domestic currency becomes weaker because you have to pay more to get one unit of foreign currency. Okay, so going down conversely means that the domestic currency appreciates, you have to pay less, 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 less. And this is what happened to the dollar euro exchange. So the, the euro was appreciating for quite some time up until 2008. Yeah. In, on June 25 in 2008, yeah, some 13 years ago, you only had to pay 64 euro cents against the dollar. That was the time when the euro was strongest vis-a-vis -vis the dollar. Okay, what happened then? 2008, global financial crisis struck, and then you saw a sharp appreciation of the dollar against the euro. Yeah, in the course of a couple of months, you know, you suddenly had uh, to pay a third more rather than 60 something cents you had to pay almost 80 euro cents for the dollar strong appreciation of the dollar that is also known as a safe haven currency because during financial crisis everybody panicked freaked out and even though the financial crisis originated in the u.s in the end capital was flowing into the u.s and that pushed up the value of the dollar because in times of crisis People want to be invested in, in, a, in a safe currency and the uh, dollar is, is considered a, a safe haven currency. Okay, and then you can try to make sense of other movements. Yeah, So the dollar was appreciating then against the euro or the euro was depreciating against the um, 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 dollar here 2014, 15 and so forth. Uh, we will try to make sense of these movements later in particular when we talk about monetary policy, because we understand that monetary policy plays a first order um, role in determining the value of currencies, mostly through its interest rate policy. And in that time here, just to foreshadow some of the discussion we will have later in the course, the US where was recovering yeah, while the euro area was still uh, suffering from what was then the euro area crisis. I mean, in the euro area, we were basically moving from the global financial crisis into the euro area crisis. And as a result, growth was low. And in particular, inflation was low and interest rates were low. And so the dollar was gaining um, against the euro. So that, that was that period. OK, but we were going to talk about this. Let's, let's briefly look uh, at another currency, which could be interesting. Let's look at... Um, pound sterling vis-a-vis -vis euro. So that's the British currency. And uh, so again, we switch to our notation because we take the perspective of, uh, of Germany, of euro land vis-a-vis -vis, uh, UK. And so we ask, okay, so how much euros do we need to pay to get one unit of foreign currency, one British pound? Yeah, and that's, you see what happened. And here there's one famous episode. Uh, so here you see the, the euro appreciated quite a bit against the uh, British pound. Yeah? Uh, and then in June 2016, uh, June 20, 2016, yes, uh, there was another important incident. You may remember, what was it? It was the referendum for Brexit. Uh, and in the night of the referendum, June 23rd, 2016, 
the British pound lost basically 10% of its value in one single night. 10%. Yeah, that's a big movement. Uh, this happens in foreign exchange markets. And you see this basically here. Okay. When you move here, you see this big drop in a single day. Yeah. Uh, that was when the pound depreciated. Again, that could be easily rationalized through monetary policy and what people expected it to do in response to the Brexit referendum. And we're going to look at these episodes later. Yeah? Uh, now, towards the end of the sample, you see also that the pound has been gaining ground a little bit against the euro, maybe reflecting the recent developments with the pandemic, uh, because, as you know, the UK has been faster in vaccinating people than uh, the euro um, area and roughly speaking yeah we would say that if the economy is doing well its currency is appreciating and we will make sense of this through monetary policy down the road okay let me show you one more example here of an of a interesting currency uh, or exchange rate with the vd euro that's the danish cro krona a danish krone whatever you see here lots of ups and downs yeah, but, oops, is, is this right? So this is, again, not our convention. We want this convention. We want to ask, okay, how many euros do we pay? It's about 13 cents for one Dan Danish krona. And then you see lots of movements here, but this can be misleading because you have to watch the scale. Look at the left, what we see here. We're, we see that, you know, these are movements in the fourth digit. Yeah, you always pay 13 cents, 13.4 cents, and then, you know, the fourth digit is, is moving a bit. Basically, what's happening here is that since the inception of the euro, since 99, the Danish krona has been pegged to the euro. So the central bank in Denmark has fixed its currency vis-a-vis -vis the euro at uh, some 13 cents per krona or 740-something uh, uh, krona per euro. Okay? Uh, and so you should not be misled by these ups and downs. It's a matter of the scale here. Okay, it's a standard trick in statistics when you present time series, you always have to be careful or you can be careful depending on how you look the scale, you, you get across quite different messages. Here it looks like lots of volatility when in fact there was no significant volatility at all. Okay, now um, here's my list of data sources. I want to show you one more example by looking at the the FRED database, which you also may remember from the macro class, so that's the FRED uh, data, Federal Reserve Economic Data. It's a very, very convenient interface, I would say. It looks now maybe a little outdated compared to the ECB, but it's very reliable and easy to use. So I'm a big fan of the of the FRED database. And here we look at the US-China exchange rate. Yeah. You see, you get it easily. And now let's look at a long time interval. Yeah? This is the time interval. And here again, you see now some interesting patterns because in the period from 95 to 2005, 10 year period, the exchange rate between the Chinese currency, renminbi or yuan, yeah, was fixed towards the dollar by the Chinese central bank. Uh, later, they, they relaxed that and they intervened less, the Chinese, in order to fix the exchange rate. But that was always an ongoing discussion to what extent uh, the, the Chinese central bank was manipulating its currency. Uh, and here you see it neatly in this time series plot that there was really no movement at all. Okay? Great. So these are just examples of how you can access data directly yeah, and see what's going on. Um, in international financial markets, and we will do this uh, throughout the course, but we should also uh, incentivize you to do it at some point in the exercise classes or in what I will uh, introduce later, and I will call application sessions. Yeah? Now, one more interesting statistic here straight from these databases is if you go to the BIS, Bank of International Settlement Bank um, database, they report every three years the survey of foreign exchange turnover, and that's quite remarkable. So I included a direct link here so to find this directly. So what you get here is, um, is uh, a simple statistic. Global foreign exchange market turnover 
these are daily averages. Yeah? In a year, what is turned over on international financial markets in terms of currencies? Yeah? And what's striking here is the volume. Okay? Because here it's millions of US dollars. So if a student prepared this graph, you may think, okay, uh, he screwed it up, so millions, and then he used dollars. No, but these are eight millions, millions. Yeah, you see here, uh, eight millions is, is the top on the on the Y scale. Is eight millions, and the units are already millions. So what you have here is eight trillions. Okay, so this was the, the the latest power here is 2019. And there you see, roughly speaking, 6.5 trillions daily, daily turnover. So that's the volume of transactions on foreign exchange uh, change markets, which we are talking about. So this is big fish. Yeah? To put this into perspective, yeah? Yeah, let me remind you of what world GDP was in 2019. So that's for the entire year. Yeah? And this was... Um, let me check, 87, oops, 87 trillions US dollars. Yeah. US GDP also in 2019 was 21 trillions. Germany, 3.8 trillions. Okay, I mean, this is rough numbers, but it doesn't matter here given the scale uh, we are talking about. This is per year, yeah, the value is produced, that's one way to measure GDP, the value produced in the world or in Germany. Yeah. And uh, so if we are looking here at global currency transactions, we, we understand this is 6.5 trillions per day, okay? So basically it takes 15 days for the value of currency transactions to amount to a one year's total value of goods and services which are produced in the world. Okay, what I'm telling you here is this is large numbers. Okay, it's also interesting here to look at the decomposition uh, which you have here provided by the Bank of International Settlements. You have the, uh, the spot, that's the blue bar, so that's the second largest item here. Uh, in basically all those years, that's maybe uh, two trillions. Spot means on the spot here, so exchange currency for currency, euros in dollars and vice versa. Yeah. Uh, then you have forwards, that's the yellow bar. A forward exchange is when you contract today an exchange which takes place at some future date, yeah. a forward, yeah. while the price is fixed today. So the price of the exchange yeah, is known today and you agree at that exchange rate to exchange currency, say, in one month from now, in three months from now, in five years from now. Yeah, there are various forward contracts. Yeah, and you see, this is important. You, basically, if you know you have some expense in dollars and you don't want to have an exchange rate risk, you can buy these dollars now at the forward uh, contract, so you will get the dollars in three months when you need them basically to pay for something and you already understand the price now so you don't encounter any exchange rate risk. That's the basic idea. Similarly, with FX swaps, foreign exchange swaps, here the idea is you combine a spot transaction with a forward transaction. So uh, you would basically buy dollars now and resell them in three uh, months down the road and there would be no exchange rate risk because the prices would be fixed today for today's transaction, which is buying dollars and for the future transaction, which is selling the dollars. So this is also for uh, firms important, which do not want to be exposed to exchange rate risk when they engage in some foreign transaction. And you see, this is big fish. This is actually this FX swaps, the largest chunk of these daily exchange rate turnover. So maybe th uh, three trillions. Yeah. So roughly Germany's GDP in one year is here transacted in one day. Okay, this is food for thought. If you wonder why do we care about this, 
well, at least it's big money, okay? I don't know whether it's sufficient for motivation, but uh, at least it, it's maybe worthwhile thinking a little bit about this. Okay, so here's some, after this money talk, let's, let's do a bit more philosophical considerations here and prepare the crown for what we do in terms of analysis. Yeah? So uh, we will look at countries rather than households and firms. And make no mistake, we are not stupid. Yeah? We understand that actual transactions are executed by individuals. Yeah? And for instance, you could think of you doing an online purchase with your credit card in US dollar. It's charged in US dollars, it shows up on your uh, bank statement as a, as a dollar transaction on your credit card. You may think of some bank selling or some banker selling a Greek government bond to the European Central Bank, and these are transactions which involve foreign assets. Yeah. Still, in our language, we will dis mostly not look at these individuals, but rather at countries, and we will talk about countries as if there were individuals. Okay, so country A is selling this, or country B is buying this. Okay. Now, and we will focus on the external transactions of these countries. Yeah. So, why is that? Why is that not stupid? Well, the underlying idea is that within each country, you have a representative agent. Okay. I understand that this notion of a representative agent is not very much liked by students. I think this is because it's not fully appreciated what we are doing here. Yeah? A representative agent is a useful concept because we think that the actions of the representative agent represent in a meaningful way what is the outcome of the average transaction within a country. Okay, So we understand that within countries we have lots of heterogeneity. People do differ. They differ in terms of their tastes. They differ in terms of their income. Yeah? In terms of their savings, yeah? people are different. But in the end, when we look at a country's transaction with the rest of the world, we basically lump together these decisions which are taken by different individuals within a country and look at the average person. Okay? And so what we do ignore here, what we do abstract from is the entire distribution of people within a country. Okay? In macroeconomics over the last 10 years or so, there has been huge progress in modeling this distribution and accounting for the heterogeneity within countries. And currently, people, myself included, are working on models which allow for heterogeneity within countries and then still looking at cross-border transactions within these complex models where in each country you have an entire distribution of people accounting for the differences across these people. But this is a huge cost in terms of complexity and whether there are equivalent gains in terms of additional insights is still an ongoing debate. So what we do here in this lecture yeah, is we make this simplifying assumption that by looking at the average behavior, we do not make a big first order mistake. Okay. Now, of course, it depends on the question as always. If you think you want to understand what the distributional effects are of certain international transactions, then you need to account for the heterogeneity. But most of the time, we are not interested in these distributional questions in this class here. And so our premise is that we can abstract from this heterogeneity. Okay? So in other words, we, we ignore issues pertaining to aggregation. And we say it's okay to aggregate, meaning, roughly speaking, bundling together the decisions of all the individuals within the country and look at them as if they were taken by one average guy. Yeah, and one, one, one important statistic which comes out of this would be um, uh, the, the net purchases of foreign assets taken by the country. Yeah? 
where we understand underneath that country's decision are millions or trillions of decisions by individuals, by you and me, you know, shifting, rebalancing our portfolios after the U.S. election, say, in light of corona developments, whatever you do, and you buy f stuff. And in the end, we, we look at the net result of this, where net is not only netting out across individuals, but also the net between purchases of foreign assets and uh, foreign purchases of domestic assets, which are basically, from an accounting perspective, our liabilities. And we subtract assets from liabilities to get the net purchase of foreign assets, that is the flow. Yeah, and we will look at the current account later because the current account summarizes the current account summarizes uh, this net purchase flow within a given period, usually a year or a quarter. Yeah. And then we have the corresponding stock variable, and that is what has been added to the liabilities within a year over the years. So you see here for Germany, the uh, total assets in blue relative to GDP and the total liabilities of Germany in, in red. Yeah? So you see that this has been increasing over time from low levels in the 70s. It was like 25% yeah, of GDP and then over time it grew. It took off really in the mid-90s uh, and to the early 2000s reached a level of 200% and now it's kind of fairly has been fairly stable over the years. You see also there's a gap. Germany is a net creditor to the world because it has more assets than liabilities. Yeah? That's the stock, uh, what has been accumulated over time. And in each period, we, we look at what is added to this when we look at the current account, that is the flow yeah? within a year, whether there's more or less uh, um, assets minus liabilities. Okay. One more remark on this cross-border trade of assets. Sometimes these obligations are not paid back. And that's been at times a major concern in international finance. Some 10 years ago, we had the euro crisis in full swing in 2012. Greek, Greece, Greece defaulted on, on a part of its foreign debt. And that was, you know, that, that was unthinkable like five years before that event. We thought Europe in Europe, we wouldn't see a country not paying back its debt obligations. And yet it happened in 2012. And we will look at this event in some detail down the road. Yeah? Traditionally, this has been a big issue in emerging economies. Argentina was a classic defaulter. They had several defaults in the 20th century. Um, and, um, and what this graph illustrates on top of that is that these defaults come in waves. Uh, it has not been included to uh, uh, updated to include the euro crisis, uh, so it would be interesting whether we see another spike there in the early 2010 uh, when when we saw uh, Greek defaulting. So you see here this this is the fraction of countries in default. So the 80s saw episode of uh, of defaults when when there were basically 18 defaults in one year. So 18 countries not paying back its debt. Um, and so forth. And then there were periods of relative calm here, so in the post-Second World War period. Right now it's also calm, and we're going to, in all likelihood, if that pattern is worth anything, we're going to see another wave of defaults at some point, maybe in two years, maybe in five years, maybe in ten years. Yeah. Uh, and that's also an interesting aspect when you talk about cross-border trade in assets, can you be sure that what you lend to another country will be paid back at some point? Or is there a chance that the country says, hey, guys, sorry, I can't pay back my debt? OK, so this was just as a, te a little teaser, you know, giving you a few uh, a few data points and to see what kind of themes uh, and uh, problems come up once you once you stare at this data. Now, I want to briefly outline the structure of this uh, this lecture. So I will do, you will have 14 lectures, which are all recorded, uh, and you can watch them whenever you find this most convenient for you. I, my aim is to go for 60 minutes within each lecture. This would be a substitute for a 90 minutes lecture, which we usually have in class when there is some time for questions and interactions. We will have 
uh, on Elias, a forum where you can ask questions uh, and when you can write down questions and I will try to answer that. Okay, there are three parts of the lecture. The first six lectures or the five next lectures are about this international asset trade. We will develop our framework to think this through. Then lecture seven to 10 will talk about exchange rates. And then in the last part, we talk about monetary policy and how it can influence exchange rates. So it's also about exchange rate, but about monetary policy's uh, specific role. Or as I already hinted, there will be application sessions because you know it might be a, a bit uh, little interactive, interactive if you just watch uh, these 14 lectures. So I will provide more details on the course page about these four application sessions where I try to talk with you about specific problems uh, as a way to deepen some, some aspects by applying models or notions to recent developments. Okay, details will be provided on EDS about these four application sec uh, sessions. And then as the semester is running, every second week we will have an exercise class where you solve problems with simple algebra. This is a particularly relevant because there will be an exam at some point, and so it's good to practice how to do the math, basically. So the, the, lecture, the, the semester is basically 14 weeks, and we will have uh, seven exercise classes. Okay. Now, for the remaining 15 minutes or so in today's class, I want to, today's lecture, I should say, uh, to stick to the terminology here, I want to revisit some a basic uh, concept, uh, from, namely the balance of payments. You have seen this in Macro 1 already, but it's been some time and you may have for, forgotten some of it. Yeah, so this is just a refresher or reminder if you want. This is a core concept from the national accounting system. And the idea is in the balance of payments, you record your transactions in the rest of the world. So it's important to keep this in mind when you look at certain uh, features of the data. Yeah? So the balance of payments comes in three parts. There's the current account, there's the capital account, and there's the financial account. Typically in international money and finance, we talk a lot about the current account. In the current account, we measure on the one hand, uh, the transactions with the rest of the world in terms of goods trade and in terms of services trade. I told you we are interested in the flow of resources. The idea is in the current account, we measure the resources which are currently flowing from one country to the other country. And the current account balance looks at the difference between outflows of resources from the domestic economy to the rest of the world and the inflow of resources, be it goods or services, from the rest of the world into our country. Yeah? And if there's more outflows, if we provide more resources to the rest of the world, say we sell more goods, yeah, then we have a current account surplus. Yeah? And that generates some extra income yeah, because we get money for this outflows, roughly speaking, uh, and we get more than what we pay for the inflows. This, this is the first part of the current account. We will later ref refer to this as the trade balance or as net exports, and X for net exports. Yeah. Exports and uh, uh, imports of goods and services. This is one source of income, yeah. extra income basically from international transactions. We provide resources to the rest of the world. But we also get paid for factors trade, uh, factors of production in the traditional macroeconomic way to think things, we distinguish between labor and capital as the two factors in production. Remember your Cobb-Douglas production function, which we analyzed in the solo model, for instance. Uh, and if we say, okay, we provide labor and capital not to produce in the domestic economy, but basically we lend it to the neighboring countries, then we earn income abroad, not because we sell them fresh goods, but we sell them um, labor and capital services. Uh, 
Uh, for the classic in, uh, example is close to the border, there are some people which work in the neighboring country and they, they get paid there and that, that is income for the domestic economy yeah, earned abroad. And similarly, and that's actually more important for Germany, if you say you invest some of your capital abroad, uh, so you hold shares in a French firm, in an Italian firm, in a US firm, and you earn dividends on these shares, that's also uh, primary income. Uh, conversely, of course, there's foreigners holding shares on German firms and they get paid dividends. Uh, uh, and here in the current account, we, we, we record the net of these transactions, the income which Germans earn abroad relative to minus the income which uh, foreigners earn uh, in Germany. Okay. And the last item here is, the, is called secondary income, that is current transfers and that is, for instance, remittances. So if you have pe uh, people here sending money abroad um, to their family, that, that would also show up in the current account because that's income transferred out of Germany to other countries. Okay. Now in the current account, we record um, the sales of goods or the sales of factor services as credit, that's income. And when we buy something, when we purchase something uh, from the rest of the world, that, that's recorded as a debit. Now, the capital account is the second um, element in the balance of payments. Practically, it doesn't play an important role. It's used to keep track of one-time transactions where you have no material return. So... The classic example here is debt forgiveness. As yeah, so you have foreign aid and at some point you write off that aid and somehow you have to keep track of this. This is a bookkeeping system. yeah, And you have to um, account for the fact that this is no longer a claim or a foreign asset. And then you keep track of this in the capital account to eliminate this basically. But this doesn't happen so often for better or worse. And so in the capital account, you, uh, you don't have much action going on. The financial account, however, is very important because the financial account is typically the counterpart of the current account. In the, in the current account, we look at the sources of this income which we earn abroad, but often it happens that that income, say, is earned in foreign currency. You're paid in dollars uh, if you sell some car to the U.S., and uh, then you have foreign assets purchased, namely these dollars. And you keep track of the way you store your income, which you earn abroad. And the financial account is precisely the bookkeeping device to keep track of this income. Yeah? Typically, as you provide resources to the rest of the world, you're paid in assets, say currency, or you could say you keep this uh, you, you convert this foreign currency and buy some foreign shares or some foreign government um, debt and, and so forth, all sorts of foreign assets. Uh, um, and uh, the idea is when you are run a current account surplus, say to keep things simple because you sell more goods to the rest of the world compared to what you import from the rest of the world, you provide resources to the rest of the world and in the end, that means that you are entitled to some future payments uh, and that in turn requires you to hold some assets because these foreign assets which you then hold are nothing but the entitlement to these future payments. As we will develop in more detail in the next lecture, this is the essence of intertemporal trade. Uh, you will see this better next uh, in the next lecture. So we provide resources again today against claims for resources which we get in return in the future. And this intertemporal trade is intermediated, intermediated through this asset trade. And uh, the financial account does nothing but keeping records of these assets. Let's make things more precise. Let's look at Germany. So this is Germany's balance of payments from 2019. Yeah. So um, you see here that's 2019. And here we have the three components, current account, capital account, and financial account. Yeah. Capital account, as I said, forget about it. So these are uh, um, billions of euros. 
So the current account in Germany is, is not trivial. It's 245 billions in 2019. GDP in Germany, as we said before, was 3.8 trillions uh, or 3,800 billions, which would be roughly 6 to 7%. Yeah, the current account is 6 to 7% of GDP uh, in 2019. Then you have the components. Here, this is good straight, so this is a big chunk. So you see, uh, if you compare exports and imports, exports is 1,300, imports is 1,000 billions in 2019, so there's a more exports than imports, some 200 um, something, okay? Uh, a surplus. Services is not so important. There's a deficit of 200 uh, of 20 uh, billions. Here's the primary income. This is income on either capital or labor, and it's 90 billion. So it's certainly not uh, negligible, right? So it's it's a sizable fraction actually of the current account, and it's mostly from investment income, meaning that there are Germans holding assets abroad and they earn income on these assets. Secondary income is negative minus 50 uh, billions, also a, a sizable figure. Okay, so there's this current account surplus of 240 billion and correspondingly, there should be, you know, given that the, the capital account is accounts for nothing, a correspondingly high number for the financial account balance, which is just a counter image, yeah? So we, um, we provide resources to the rest of the world, current account, and uh, as a result, we will be entitled to future payments from the rest of the world, and uh, the way we are entitled depends on the assets which we purchase. And here in the financial account, we distinguish four uh, or five different categories, direct investment, portfolio investment, financial derivatives, other investment, and reserve assets. And here you see the largest chunk is here portfolio investments. So say you know you 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 you, you invest. Say if you if you if you sell stuff and you pay it in foreign currency, you invest this in foreign firms. Okay, that's the direct perspective. Truth to be told, it's more complex because even if you don't engage, yeah, with the rest of the world in trade, you may still invest. That's maybe true for some of you. Yeah. You know, you don't sell goods to the rest of the world, but you may still uh, buy foreign assets. But what comes into um, play here is, again, the, our perspective on the average guy. So the average German trades with the rest of the world. The average German uh, has a portfolio where there's uh, also foreign equity in there and other stuff. Yeah. Um, and uh, even though we understand this uh, on the ground, it's only a few which trade with the rest of the world and only some which invest in foreign assets. Yeah, but from the aggregated perspective, in, if we lump everything together and look at the average German, then we end up with this picture. Okay, so traditionally the focus has been a lot on trade yeah, and for a good reason because the current account um, is to a large extent driven by trade, exports minus imports. Is net is net trade already, but trade as such is also very large figures. You know, a thousand three hundred billions exports and a thousand uh, billions imports. Yeah, but the gap has been sizable in Germany, and that's an intriguing figure here for various reasons. And you know, I've been teaching this stuff since uh, I don't know the late two thousands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when I was teaching this for the first time, I was basically standing here with a figure like this and I was looking back. And then I was discussing in class and we were discussing this as the globalization. Yeah. So you saw this increasing trend in trade. This is measured relative to German GDP. Yeah, you see, you know, in the early 90s, we started off with some 20-ish percent and that number grew to 40 yeah, percent and globalization. Was a was a nice time, yeah, and then financial crisis struck, and you saw this big drop both in exports and imports. So in terms of crisis, trade suffers. What's even more striking, afterwards you see this plateauing. So no more globalization. 
Yeah, it seems that by now we can say that you know globalization has clearly come to a halt here in terms of increased trade. Then you see the Corona crisis here, and again, Corona crisis um, uh, made trade suffer. Export uh, dropped more than imports, but both dropped. Yeah. So there are many observations. So there's the globalization observation and the slowdown of globalization. Then you see in terms of crisis, trade suffers a lot. And remember, this is trade, exports and imports relative to GDP. So trade falls more than GDP yeah, since the ratio drops. And then finally, the, a very important remark is that for the last uh, almost 20 years now, we had a sizable gap. Yeah? Exports in Germany have exceeded imports, so the net exports has been always positive. And this has been also um, subject of a lot of controversy, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, and what can be done if it's a bad thing to change that. Yeah? The export Weltmeister debate discussion. So in the policy debate, it's typically understood as a sign of strength if you export a lot and import very little. I should say here that we will offer a more nuanced perspective on the issue and that we say, okay, it, at times it makes certainly sense to export a lot and to import relatively little, but there are other times where you would like to uh, have the opposite. Uh, so uh, a general message here will be that it doesn't make sense uh, to... Um, to uh, well, I, yeah. So we should be very careful here with with welfare statements. I guess that's what I want to say. Okay, I was already alluding to this. I mean, the balance of payment is basically just in a basic accounting system. It's part of the national accounting system, and so you have a double entry bookkeeping system, and each transaction is recorded twice. And as a result, if things go well, then what you have in the current account and in the capital account should add up to the financial account. I was already telling you that much and said, okay, the capital account we can basically forget. So what you have to in the current account equals what you have in the financial account. In Germany, I forgot to highlight this here. We, we have quite some sizable errors on omission in an order of magnitude of 40 billion. So that's certainly uh, uh, not small fish. Yeah. That accounts for the gap. See, the capital account is really nothing. It's not one billion. The current account has a surplus of 245 uh, billions and the financial account only uh, 200 billion. So there's some 40 billions missing, which the Bundesbank here uh, shows as errors and omissions. Okay. Now, um, how do things evolve over time? Yeah. For this... For this to keep track of, we define the net international investment position. Sometimes it's also called uh, the net foreign asset position. It really means the same thing. And we use the letter B to denote the net position. Yeah? So that would be total assets minus total liabilities. Yeah? And within a year, say, or one period, we say what's changing here. So BT would be at the beginning of the year, your net foreign assets on net international position, and this would be at the beginning of the next year. So that's the change within one year. Yeah? And the change in one year in that position would be equal to the financial account, because in the financial account, we, we record the flow, yeah? what's added to different positions, both in terms of assets and liabilities. Uh, we, we, well, when I showed you the Bundesbank statistic here, you see already the net, the difference between purchases and sales. Okay? So the financial account, which is equal to the current account plus the capital account, is adding to the net international investment position. Okay? Now, here's one more important remark. In principle, the change in the net international investment position is equal to current account plus capital account. But there's also at times valuation effects, and these valuation effects can be there for various reasons. For instance, some of the um, foreign assets you hold as a country is foreign stocks, and the foreign stock market go, 
may go well or poor, may, may do poorly, so your foreign assets lose value. That's one source of valuation effects. The other source, it's even more intriguing, this comes from currency movements, exchange rate movements, right? Because there's nothing which prevents countries to own foreign assets which are denominated in foreign currency and to owe liabilities which are denominated in domestic currency. And when you have, whenever the exchange rate moves, you get valuation effects. Yeah? So if your currency appreciates, your foreign assets lose value if you express them in domestic currency. And your liabilities gain value. Yeah? So you have negative valuation effects in terms of appreciation. You can, in practice, these valuation effects are very important. Yeah? So you see this here because the red line gives you the current account and the capital account. And you see that evolves over time. That's for the U.S. And then in blue, you see the change from one year to the next of the net foreign asset position, which in theory, without valuation effect, should be equal to the red line, but it's clearly not. Yeah? And the difference is due to valuation effects. There may also be measurement issues because it's hard to measure these uh, net foreign assets. Uh, but uh, by and large, we see here that this valuation effect can be important. It's also been investigated in the context of the global financial crisis in a paper by Gorinchas and Quarter, which is on the reading list on the ELIA side, which I recommend for reading. It's an easy reading. It discusses the balance sheet of the US, yeah? again, taking this accurate perspective, pretending there was the average US guy and... Uh, this average U.S. guy has assets in the rest of the world and owes liabilities which foreigners own in the U.S. And in the context of the global financial crisis, 2007 to 2009 here, they document a huge loss, huge losses in the U.S. in its foreign portfolio. And here they, they provide some detailed statistics for the U.S. portfolio and how it evolved in that time period. And you see that liabilities lost value in an order of magnitude of 3,000 billions, but the assets lost even more value. This was global financial crisis, stock market tanked across the globe. But as I said in the beginning, the dollar also appreciated. So taking the perspective of the US, its foreign assets lost value much more than its domestic liabilities. Yeah? So the total was some 3,000 billions. Yeah, so that's, I mean, at the time it was some 20% of US GDP. Just valuation effects in the crisis because asset prices moved and exchange rate moved, and they moved against the US balance sheet. Yeah. Um, Gorinja et al. and co authors, they, they talk about the exorbitant duty. And we will get back to this because they say in normal times, the U.S. enjoys an exorbitant privilege. We will talk about this. So it gets a fair deal in its asset trade with the rest of the world. And it gets a fair deal precisely in terms of crisis. It helps the world to the extent that valuation effects move against the U.S. and in favor of the rest of the world. Yeah, that would be the exorbitant duty. We will talk about this later. Let me skip this graph and let, let me make a last remark. The current account on which, about which I talked already uh, quite a bit from national accounting can be related to the difference between saving and investment. If you remember from our macro class, we can write domestic output or GDP as the sum of consumption and that would be private and public consumption. There's no government spending here for simplicity. So we lump this together in C here, total consumption. Same with investment, this could be a private and public investment and net exports. That much you remember from your basic macro class. Now, an important concept here is the uh, cross national disposable income, which is not the same as a cross domestic product because cross domestic product is the income earned within a certain territory, within the domestic territory. The cross national disposable income is the income which is disposable uh, for domestic residents. And the, 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 what accounts for the difference is precisely this primary and secondary income from the rest of the world. 
Yeah? So we define the gross national disposable income as GDP plus what we earn as primary income, as explained before, because we have capital and labor working abroad or because secondary income, there's transfers from the rest of the world. Or to, it could be negative because it's in, uh, in net terms, it's a transfer to the rest of the world. Okay, with this definition, yeah, we can simply uh, remember that the current account is equal to net exports plus primary balance of income, balance of secondary income. Yeah, this is if you go back here, what we saw for the from the Bundesbank. Yeah, primary income and secondary income. Remember, goods and services we lump together as net exports. Yeah? So this is goods and services, this is primary income, and this is secondary income from the rest of the world. Now, we can substitute this here and say, okay, the output is C plus X plus NX, but NX is nothing but current account minus PBI minus BSI, okay? And then, let me continue this here, we can solve this equation for the current account and say the current account is output plus PBI plus BSI minus C minus X. So what this is, is just Y, G, and DI, cross national disposable income. And that's what yeah. that equation here at the bottom of the slide says. Yeah. The current account is equal to disposable income of domestic residents minus consumption. That's nothing but savings. Yeah. Disposable income of domestic residents minus what they save. Yeah. That's why we use the letter S. Yeah. So this is S here, savings minus um, what we invest in terms of domestic capital goods, okay? So what this equation uh, tells us is the current account is just a gap between um, savings and investment. In a closed economy, you may remember, that's what we also stressed in macro, you have savings equal to investment. But in an open economy, when you have transactions with the rest of the world, the current account is the wedge between savings and investment. Another way to think about this, and we will make this more precise, is that the current account is nothing but savings which you invest in the rest of the world. Yeah, so the intriguing question which will come up uh, later in the course is where do we invest? Do we invest in physical capital in the domestic economy or do we invest our savings in the rest of the world? Basically by saying, okay, let's lend resources to the US to France, to Greece, because we want to have some payment down the road. And the payment down the road uh, to which these assets, which we purchase, entitle us, uh, have to be compared to the returns which, which we would earn by investing in the domestic capital stock, building machines here, building factories here. Again, the average guy here in Germany would build these factories or build these machines and would earn interest or returns, dividends on, on these domestic investments, okay? So I think that's an intriguing perspective and that will uh, you know, be our perspective in, in the next lectures. Let me just summarize here. So what we were repeating today, the basic idea is balance of payments summarizes international transactions of, current, uh, of countries. In the current account, we record net exports of goods and services but also income on factor services and transfers that would be primary and secondary income. Yeah, in the financial account, we record where we put these extra resources, which we get from the rest of the world. Oh, this is maybe a too German perspective because I always assume in the head of my mind that we have a current account surplus. If we had a current account deficit, we would be borrowing. Yeah, and then the financial account would um, tell us uh, which assets per foreigners hold, or conversely, which liabilities which we sell and which would 
oblige us to pay back in the future the resources which we borrow today if we run a current account deficit. That would be the debtor's perspective. Germany, for the reasons I just gave you in the past 20 years or so, has been a, a, a debtor, a, a creditor. So, uh, and that, that informs a bit my, my discussion here. Okay, so there's, I haven't talked about the readings. You will have more details on the readings on the ELIA side. There's a detailed list. In that course, we don't follow a specific textbook exactly. The closest thing to a course textbook we have would be the book by Philip Harms. It's been published by Moore Siebeck in Tübingen, uh, the, the second edition in 2016. So it's a five-euro book, basically. And uh, we follow that book somewhat, but not entirely. So I will give you other readings as, as we go along. And you have a detailed uh, reference list in, uh, on uh, Elias. That's it for the first lecture. Thank you.